Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Board Game Geek Show for April 26, 2018. I am your host, Scott Alden, also known as Aldi on Twitter. I am once again joined by my fabulous co-hosts, W. Arc Martin and Lincoln Damhurst. How are you guys doing? Hey, Scott. Good. Hey, guys. Doing great. So we are freshly back from some travel and conventioning where we had some uh, great planning and work and games all in one. Uh, also, we have a huge announcement to make, and uh, I will let our past selves take it away from here. Go ahead, past selves, and let us know what that announcement is. Hey everybody, this is Aldi from Board Game Geek with a special announcement. Starting on May 1st, 2018, Rodney Smith of Watch It Play It will be joining forces with Board Game Geek to create new programming content, along with his usual Watch It Play tutorials and gameplay videos. As director of media for Board Game Geek, I'm especially excited to be working with Rodney and Pep on these new videos. And not only that, we're looking forward to expanding our convention coverage and having special events at these conventions and BGGCon. Yeah, this whole thing has been incredibly serendipitous, really, in a lot of ways, because I started Watch It Played from my basement, which is still technically where I am, but it's allowed me to connect in a lot of ways to the larger gaming community. And I can't personally think of another organization, at least in my mind, that supports the gaming community the way that Board Game Geek does. So it means a lot to me to be a part of this team in create not only supporting me, but also to be able to support BGG, really. And it's funny because I know I don't think you guys know this, but before we first talked about the idea of collaborating, I had been personally thinking, like, you know, if I want to be a part of something bigger, what's a good fit for me? There's so few options. And the only one I, could, I kept coming back to was Board Game Geek. And then Lincoln, I think it was, well, it was both of you and Essen, we ran into each other. Oh, and then you kind of grabbed me by the arm. Was, yeah. He was, I had been thinking, like, I really like Rodney's content which I don't like using that word, but um, <laughs> I really like what he does. And I was thinking about how much effort he had to put into fundraising. And I asked him, I'm like, what would, how much time do you spend doing uh, preparing for these fundraisers? And how much brain power does it take? Because we could maybe do more stuff and if we take that away from his responsibilities. Right. right. And it was really just like, well, it, that, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uncertainty as well, quite frankly, right? Yeah. Every year. And, yeah, every, every year, year after year. And I've had a very supportive community and now they're not going to do, have to do quite as much to support the show in that way because of this this working relationship we're going to have so i'm really really excited about that and it was i mean i think we all got in a scrum together talking yeah, we, about this and we realized wow this is exactly what all of us want this is so perfect yeah, yeah we were <laughs> having a conversation about the idea and rodney and i were talking back and forth and for each statement by statement we kept going back and forth and just we were totally on the same page yeah so it was really really it incredible almost thing. was frictionless like, yeah after talking and deciding to do this. Look, uh, I've made many videos. They are certainly on YouTube, but the home and the heart of Watch It Play has always been Board Game Geek. I mean, look, when I first started seven, is it, yeah, seven years ago, uh, you know, my videos out there on YouTube, it's like a needle in a haystack. But by having them on Board Game Geek, that's how my people found me, right? right. <laughs> the board gaming men and women of the community, they were able to find my videos there because Board Game Geek existed. So this is really, to me, the perfect fit. And my show, those of you who have watched my show in the past, you know I don't review. It's very important to me to sort of remain opinionless there, right? And by being with BGG, I mean, you have kind of an agnostic outlook. Well, that was the one thing I said to you at Essen. And you were very excited that I said that because that was exactly your mindset. It was just another one of those things yeah. where we, as we were talking, said, oh, that's exactly the way I feel about it. It was perfect. Because we're here to promote the hobby and the joy of the hobby. And right. if you get negative, it's hard to keep positive about <laughs> Right, that that's stuff. true. So, yeah. And some folks revel in that. And, it's, and there's lots of good spaces for that, too. Course, right. you know, not in criticism. Wrong. We are, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we're just not in criticism, which is great. And Rodney's exactly in line with us on that. So it's, yeah, I, I'm very excited to get started with this, and it's, it's right around the corner, right around the corner. So exactly. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Well, we're here. So you're right, we're here at a convention. Yeah. We should get to game playing. I'm excited. <laughs> let's yes, go play some more of the mind. You guys need a new, news for the news segment. I think this is news. So we've done that. <laughs> yes. Let's go play some games. Yes, let's go. Right. Well, we have to talk about what games we've played. So let's go that's do true. it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everybody. everybody. So there's our big announcement. I am super excited to have Rodney Smith of Watch a Play joining Board Game Geek and the rest of the team. And we're going to do some great stuff together. And uh, I assume you guys are happy about this too. What do you think? I'm really excited about it. I cannot wait to get some of the uh, show ideas that we have in store. Also, more convention events and having Rodney in our team will be great. Origins, he has some stuff planned, so he'll be with us a little bit. But he's going to be 
um, with us a lot for Gen Con, which is going to be really great. My previous interaction with Rodney has only been bringing him odd games to teach at BGG Con. So this will be good. I'll have more chances to do that and probably do some other things too. <laughs> Well, he's super excited about it, too. I just talked to him uh, before we started filming, and he's unfortunately a little bit under the weather, but he wanted to record that episode, that video, which we will link in the show notes below, and you can go check out the video from Watch It Played's channel and from Rodney himself. Um, Also, we should note that he is going to be attending BGG Spring as a special guest, Uh, and as of this date of you are watching this episode, the tickets are still available, so if you want to make some last-minute plans... To join us on Memorial Day weekend, um, and also join Rodney in the Spiel des Jahres committee, and all the games from Germany that have been nominated, plus our 6,000 game library will be there, uh, and you can play your hearts out. So join us for BGG Spring. Tickets will be probably sold out early next week, so don't wait. Um, It's going to be a good show. One of the best. The jury is having the new nominees there, and learning them right away is one of the best things. I now know all about every game going into the uh, announcements of the winners. The Spiel des Jahres nominees will be revealed on Monday, May 14th. So BGG Con Spring happens 10 days after that. So you can come in to the show and try out everything there. We don't know what those nominees are yet. Maybe we can speculate on our next show. <laughs> try that. That's right. That's all we can do. We're not jury members. I like to speculate. <laughs> Uh, another thing coming up too, Lincoln and I will be at the Tokyo Game Market at the beginning of May to record game overviews at that show, uh, introduce Lincoln to the spectacle that is Game Market, and we'll have coverage of that in a future show as well. I'm really excited about that. I hope that uh, it's two days now, which was the impetus for me wanting to actually even go because I wasn't certain how much we could get done in such a short amount of time, but with the preview night where the prototypes and stuff like that happen and or day evening or whatever and um then the two days of coverage and you said some vendors aren't even there both days so will likely not be there both days so that's really cool i'm looking forward to the new oink games as well i've already i've already got people asking me to bring some back <laughs> <laughs> don't agree never agree <laughs> they're tiny do not commit yourself. No, because things will sell out instantly and you will have to be chasing down. And uh, they are very strong with lines and staying in line. Do not try to cut. Okay. Okay. You cannot do that. They will They will shun you. They will shun me. And direct you in the proper way. So I, I find it tough just to agree to do things for people. Surprise people with things. Ah, that's but, a plan. But, but don't agree to bring them stuff. Except for Scott, which we'll bring, we'll bring him an oink game. I was gonna, I, I, I basically said I'd try to get one for Scott, myself, and my friend. The only thing on my list is Cat Gammon. Is Cat Gammon? <laughs> yeah, it looks awesome. It does. <laughs> we'll have to see if we can. Even do that. though I don't really like backgammon, I will gladly play Cat Gammon. Okay. Do they change the rules at all, or is it just pure backgammon? There are some special cards, which I believe you can manipulate the dice, and I think they're just one-off effects on how you can do things. But otherwise. Backgammon with cat heads. That sounds good, though. <laughs> I know that Scott will probably want to get one for Michelle, and I'm going to probably want to get one for Nikki. That's right. Uh, the new Oink Games just announced as well, called Money Bags, that has very cryptic description so far. But I think we'll be recording an overview of that. So something else. Well, that there. that is the game that I've I've been asked to get. <laughs> okay. There you go. Hey, uh, maybe we should move on from those games to other games right let's talk about what you've been playing so why don't you start us off lincoln well i played a a bunch of great games i actually played some of the games that you played uh that you're going to mention um which i'll let you talk about i played penny paper adventures from sit down games and henry kermarak i think that's correct and they are a roll and write game series and it's three uh, three boxes so far, and they start for ages seven up, then the next box is ages eight and up, and the box after that is nine and up. And I gotta tell you, they ramp up in complexity pretty quickly. Um, I, m- during our plays, many of us were like, I don't know if kids could handle this, but I think it's pretty great, especially since you can start with the youngest one um, that is not really complicated, 
uh, but is really fantastic. And what's really great about the whole series is they actually have interaction where there is a bad roll on the die, which takes precedence over all the other rolls. And what you do is you put your sheet in the middle and then somebody randomly takes one, not theirs, and then places the symbol for that bad action. And then it's up to you in the following turns to um, mitigate it. And it is really, really cool. Um, and it changes quite a bit between each game and how you deal with stuff. And uh, really, really great. Yeah, the Penny Papers series was way more um, interesting than I thought it would be. Not that it wasn't going to be interesting, but I thought it would be very simple. It's a kid's game, mostly. Uh, but I was really intrigued by the first episode that we played together, um, which was super fun. Like, you get to put zombies on other people's other people's papers, so that gives them sort of an obstacle to avoid. That was a really cool idea. I also played Fox in the Forest from Foxtrot Games and Renegade Games and Joshua Burgell. And... Um, it is a two-player trick-taking game that has a really, really great way of dealing with just two players playing a trick-taking game. There's all these special powers on each of the suits. There's only three suits, and certain cards give you, let you change the trump, let uh, just act as trump for that round, and it's really, really spectacular. I um, was blown away at how well it played for two, and the art is unbelievably gorgeous. And I'm really, I don't actually have it yet. I'm really looking forward to getting it. Has either of you guys played it? I have not, which is stupid because I love trick taking games. So And two players, come on, it's right up your alley. <laughs> That's right. I'll have to do that. Usually, two player, it turns out to be other things and not trick. You know, you, you got to switch that mindset for what you're looking for. Uh, so We also played Thanos Rising Adventures Infinity War from Andrew Wolf and USAopoly, which is a cooperative co- uh, card game um, with die rolling. Uh, that is really, really fun, actually. The way it works is the you're all fighting Thanos and you're uh, trying to prevent him from uh, getting the gems in the, inf- uh, the Infinity Gauntlet. And uh, really, really fun. There was a spectacular look for the game. All the characters are there. You're, you're absolutely going to lose characters. Uh, it's de- you have to work together to make everything happen. Um, we actually did pretty well. And... Uh, kind of continued a little bit on from there, but it is really fun. Scott played that with us as well. Yeah, Thanos was quite a challenging game. It started off pretty rough, and um, but we overcame with the fabulous team of the Avengers and the uh, Wachovians. What is it? <laughs> Wakandians? Wachovians. Wakandians Wachovia. and the, um, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and who else was Doctor there? Strange. Oh, Doctor Strange. Avenger. Yeah, it was great. It was very cool. It has all of the characters. It has all the characters. The villains are cool. They're. It, it's got a nice challenge, um, and we played the hard mode. We did beat it in the end, but uh, it was a close call. The other game we played was, uh, again, with Scott, was uh, Lord of the Rings game. We played it this time with two expansions, and holy cow, is that game hard. Um, when we played with Scott recently, we just played the vanilla version of the game, and this one we played... Yeah, we played the Friends and Foes and the Battlefields expansion. We did not... And we, and we played with part of the Sauron expansion, just a little part of it. The Battlefields expansion is crazy hard, and that with the uh, oncoming foes that we kept having, we could we were trying to deal with them, and there's this little tease in the game that you could skip over certain sections of the games, and I think we missed the first jump, but we were able to jump to Shelob's Lair, which was really, really ridiculous. And uh, we, we by that point, I think we'd already lost two, and it was downhill from there. Yeah, I really like the increased difficulty those um, expansions add. Uh, and I think Nikki had some tremendous bad luck where she kept turning over the bad tiles and we could not just, we could not get started. We were hit by like seven events in a row or something crazy like that. It was not not good, not a good start. It depleted of us of a lot of resor- resources and I don't think we ever really recovered after that. We are just kind of like catching our breath the entire time. We never felt strong again, and then it just kind of kept beating us down until I think we Sauron beat us in Shelob's Lair. <laughs> it was pretty bad, and she really did have two really terrible rounds and a couple not-so-great ones after that where she just kept flipping over bad event, bad event, and, uh, you know, we're able to skip one if we take on one, and it was still not enough. And then, of course, we would the rest of us would flip over one or two tiles, and they wouldn't be, you know, it would be we'd find the good thing right away or whatever. It was just not great. But it is a really fantastic game. What did you play, Scott? The big hit of the show for me was Detective. That is the new investigative team game, cooperative game from Ignacy Trebchek from Portal Games coming out, I believe, at Gen Con. 
Um, and it, we played the first chapter along with Nikki and Lincoln, and we attempted to solve the first part of a five-chapter puzzle. Attempted is um, right. And we... <laughs> so we did miserably. <laughs> the funniest thing was we kept coming up with plausible uh, reasons to spend our resources, which were like, oh, we're coming up with all these kind of crazy hypotheses. <laughs> and eventually it just turned out it was not true. Like, we were just going on hunches and, like, intuition and kind of like, wow, that would, you know, we've watched too much CSI, right? Like, <laughs> or maybe we haven't watched it. Maybe we haven't watched enough CSI because we never went to the lab. <laughs> we never, and the laboratory is super critical in that game. So if you play this game detective, make sure to go to the laboratory. Um, <laughs> not just rely on your gut instincts. Use science. <laughs> yes. Science is power. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything from the game. Um, it's one of those games, though, that I really love, like, Turn off your phone. Well, un- well, you can't turn off your phone because you you need to check the internet for certain clues that will help you uh, come to conclusions on certain things. So that was pretty cool. That had not been done before. I, th- I really like that. Um, and you know, you there's an app I guess online that'll be available, and you track your um, ev- evidence, and you track your suspects, and there's bios, and there's all kinds of cool stuff. And I'm not going to talk about the plot at all. So I will move on to my other game that I played that I really loved at this convention we went to was Keyflow, which I think Richard Brees, uh, it's a key game. Richard Brees had called it the Keyflower card game, but Keyflow was the new name. But I think that may not be the final name. So if you see the game, it's either going to be Keyflow or Keyflower card game. And who knows, maybe look them up with another thing. But if you like Keyflower, this game is awesome. Uh, it takes away some of the parts in Keyflower, streamlines it, but it has a lot of the feeling of Keyflower. So if you um, didn't like the bidding uh, part of Keyflower, or if you just wanted to do the resource generation and the fun parts, in my opinion, they're the more fun parts. Um, but I've I've heard other people like the bidding, so whatever your 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 opinion, whatever. But it is super fun. It's a drafting game, and then you play immediately, and it's it's done very quickly. It's 45 minutes to an hour. We played five player. It went by in a heartbeat. And of course, I was like, oh, well, I want to play again immediately because I could do a better job. So it's got that perfect blend of many paths to winning that you can't master on the first play. So it's definitely one to look forward to. I believe it will be out at Spiel. Cool. I was, uh, that was definitely a lot of people were talking about it. And I, ne- I did not get a chance to play it. Yeah, definitely. This, this convention was a little weird. Normally, we get to play a lot of pre release stuff and, and see prototypes and. And nothing was really clicking for me. I mean, I, I've i played a bunch of stuff at it, so I definitely was um, pleased with what I played. But when I played Keyflow, it was just like, oh, that's my game. There it is. That's the one. So I'm really excited for it to come out. And seeing Richard Brees, playing with Richard Brees, in fact, was great. And um, uh, that game I'm really looking forward to. The funny thing is the real hit of the show was the mind, of course. Uh, there were so many copies of that game flying around. And I see Eric has it. Uh, Eric, what did you play? <laughs> I played the mind. I figured as much. I played endless games of the mind, and it, it was great just because every group plays differently, and you get different flow with different people. And some are like, "Well, I'm not sure what to do," and some get into it immediately, and you just see the different different styles from people. And I'm over 100 plays now, but I've talked about that a lot. So, move on. Uh, we'll have to to fake. I can't hold up a copy of Reef which is the next title from Next Move Games by Emerson Matsuuchi. And it's similar to Azul in that it's like a themed abstract game. And it hits my my sweet spot there of light interaction with puzzly comboing where you're trying to build up your reef and score based on the cards you have in your hand. And that you're drafting cards that both give you colored bits of your reef that you're going to add and have a scoring condition. And you do both parts. But those, the top part never relates to the bottom part. So you have to draft a hand that will let you put things together and score. And mostly, all you're doing with the other people is trying possibly to take things that they want or just build faster than them or take colors to end the game quickly so they don't score. But I'm only in the stage right now where you're just like looking at your own board and not worrying about other people. Did um, we play that one with you, Eric? Or was it? Uh, we we played in Nuremberg. Yeah, because I, I Nikki and Jennifer and I played it. I don't remember who our fourth was. I thought it was you, but uh, that was a, a, a great. Yeah. It's a great game, and Nikki and uh, Jennifer both had a great time playing it. There's a lot going on there, and you 
the trying to synchronize the cards to give you exactly what you need. Oh, I know what game we played. Um, <laughs> I won't bring that one up. Uh, but to, to synchronize <laughs> all the stuff together to make you know the best plays is uh, is a challenge, but it's really great. Uh, that will be previewed at Origins with some advanced copies, and then the main release is Gen Con in August. So uh, other games, uh, Face Cards by Leo Cotovini, published by Ravensburger. I've been playing this with our, our kids' board game club. And if you played Combatability, the old party game where you're trying to make pairs of things, it will remind you of that because you get a hand of people cards and you have to choose two of them that you think are a pair for whatever reason you want. And one goes in the center of the table and one goes in front of you. And then you're going to add one from the deck. You flip all those over and you're gonna take turns saying, I think you, that's the card you put in there because I will look at the card you turn face up in front of you and I choose the one that's in the middle. So it's just a little silly pairing up game, but it's, it's interesting just to see what people do. So that, that's been fun. Manga Kai, uh, Play With Scott. This is by Reiner Knizia. He did a pit-like trading game a long time ago called Weedle from Out of the Box where you are trading with the table in addition to other people and trying to make sets of things. And Manga Kai is kind of the same thing, but not the same thing. Where you have a hand of cards, which are double-sided, and you're trying to trade with people, and as soon as you get sets of things, you can claim scoring cards that are in the middle of the table. And you just do that, do that quickly, finish up, and when you're done, you say, I'm out. And when half the people say they're out, the game ends, and you score up points. So the actual playing of the game is like two or three minutes and then you're done. And it's, it's very quick and interactive and we played with adults at the convention. I played with kids and kids just trade terribly and aren't paying attention to anything. So it's <laughs> just the, the skill level. I think difference. I traded terribly. <laughs> yeah. I think that game was, it was so fast and furious. You're just like, I'll trade anything just to make a trade. It's kind of like it that. Was, and then we played I again. Kept, I felt like I was giving up the, bad, the good cards for the bad cards, yeah. Yeah, but it seemed like it's also Bonanza-ish in that as long as you make as many trades as possible, you're probably going to end up better off overall. I don't know if that's really true. Yeah, but. you can also get stuck at the end, right, with cards that don't make sets that you can't play. And yes, that kind of it kind of fizzles out at the end instead of everybody kind of finishing. But uh, we, it was it was really fun. I had a good time with it, and I like the double sided card, so you can see that someone what someone has, but um, so they can't really lie about what they have. Yeah. Whereas Pit, you can always lie about, yeah. and then you give them bull, the bear, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> right, bear. just to mess with to someone. The per, to your per, yeah, just mess them up. Also played uh, Ganz Schön Clever uh, by Wolfgang Varsch, designer of The Mine. So I'm sandwiching my, my write-up here with two Varsch games. This is a roll-and-write game uh, that looks like a spreadsheet because you're going to get a sheet that looks like this, and you're like, oh my god, what is this? Well, you're going to be rolling colored dice on your turn, and you draft one of them. And if there are any dice that are lower, you set them aside and can't roll them again, and you roll again, and you at most draft three dice, and then other players get to use one of the dice that remains behind, like quicks. Okay, so that's familiar. What really is different with this game is that your the yellow die goes here, and the blue here, and all the other colors go in. But as you reach certain levels on the score chart, then you get a bonus. So you'll get some bonus, then you get to fill in a yellow, and you fill, fill the yellow, and oh, you get to mark this orange, and da da da. And so the game goes along sort of slowly, and then suddenly you hit this like explosion of activity where everything starts bouncing off everything else, and you have special things where you get to use a, a die an extra time on a turn, and that combos off everything, and it's just all at the end. It's a very cool implementation, only available in Germany right now from Schmidt Spiele. It's really, really great. I ended up teaching it a bunch of times at the convention, and uh, I played it quite a few times myself. And everybody kept asking for, the, you know, there was barely any copies there. We had a couple of laminated sheets to be able to play it uh, so we didn't run out of stuff. And uh, people left the convention and came back with their own version of the paste, you know, like a, a print and play thing. Uh, everybody's trying to get it. It's really, really great. I actually received my copy. Friend brought it to me from Germany. That plus Illusions, which I'm surprised Scott, or Illusion, which Scott didn't mention, which is another game from Wolfgang Varsch. I was going to mention Illusion. It was another game of the show for me. Uh, I had ordered a copy from Amazon DE that came right before we left town, brought it. And I think it was, I think I had the only copy in the, in where we were 
Uh, people kept coming up to me to ask it, to borrow it, and um, it's a game where you are playing Timeline with Colors. So what that means is, when it's your turn, you are given a card with color on it, a certain percentage. You have to internally evaluate on the card, and you have to place it in the line of cards, other cards with color, in the right spot. And it's sort of like a liar's dice, that if someone after you but doesn't believe you, they can call it, and you have to check, and if you are... Um, incorrect the person that called it gets the point otherwise you get the point so the coolest thing about it is the the coolest thing about it is the thinking about try to spatially analyze the colors when you spe when you have a long line of cards and try to figure out where it fits in when in reality they only differ by one percent or sometimes they are equal in percentage of color which is really mind-bending because you could swear that was at least five percent more than the other one but the way they've done the artwork it's very like um retro and some very cool themes in there um pick it up i don't know if it's coming to the states but if you can order it over from overseas definitely get it uh Wolf, wolfgang varsh vin wins the year for games this year doesn't he yeah i i, think. I heard yeah. about the quack Solver von quidlinburg at the show we saw the demonstration at nuremberg and then i was hoping to be able to play it at the uh at the convention and uh tom felber was at the convention and he was disappointed the game wasn't there because that was the last game he took out of his bags trying to make space for everything that he had to bring and he was i was looking forward to having him teach me the game he says it's very good it has some issues that will make it not for everyone i guess but uh he thinks it's a really really good game so this guy's got an amazing year of four two previously published games and four games this year that people are talking about that's kind of amazing well i suspect we'll see that game and all the other games at BGD Spring. Played a lot. Uh, hopefully Tom will bring a Quacksalber von Quidlinburg for us to try out. News is relatively light this week. Uh, in fact, I have nothing. Uh, we're <laughs> a little busy with the convention, and April's kind of slow anyway. Companies are gearing up in the U.S. for Origins. They've already announced most of the things they're doing. So I didn't have something, but Lincoln shared something very interesting on our, our little document that we used to prepare for the show. Maybe he can introduce it. The kind of thing that was discussed at uh, the convention was that Kickstarter games are starting to steal the oxygen out of the room for s traditional Euros and other types of games. Not the you know Most of the ones are these big impact games. They draw a lot of money out of... And it's good. I mean, they're spectacular games. But we're wondering what it's doing to the rest of the hobby. Do you guys have any feelings on that? Sure. I can speculate. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> I back a lot of Kickstarters and the projects that are coming out now are so large and require an, such an investment that people may be saving their money just to spend two, three, four, five hundred dollars on a single game uh, or a game system, most likely. Uh, and that kind of hurts the forty, thirty dollar euro game that comes out in February or March and kind of didn't come out, you know, didn't come out during a show or didn't come out with a big uh, media presence that could just go unnoticed and you know like six months to eight months these games just kind of fade away unless there's somebody who picks up the torch and like you know tries to get it um get it more known um an example of something that basically kicks a huge kickstarter that we just talked about before we left town is fireball island which is closing in on two million dollars so that's a lot of money to basically for one game one title right where maybe those I'm not sure how many backers that is. What is it? 10,000 backers, maybe 20,000 backers could have bought many games with a hundred, I think over a, over the, using that, you know, using that money instead of buying one game, they would buy maybe three games. Well, the that's, it is over 15,000 backers. And an example of one that I backed that I don't think is going to make it is a game that Eric and I played at Can, the Barkside. It is a Kickstarter exclusive. It's very inexpensive. I backed it for two games, uh, two copies, I mean, and it's, it's struggling. It has eight days. I think both uh, Fireball Island and Barkside have eight days left in their campaigns. It's You never know. It may turn around for them, but they had a very uh, modest goal, and they are struggling to get to it. Also with eight days left is Zombicide Invader, which has cleared $2 million. So that's another example of something giant that just, like, that's, that just consumes everything. It's kind of interesting. Uh, also, just to merge into a Kickstarter segment here while we're talking about this, Confrontation, which I haven't played. I'm not a minis guy, but I've seen a lot of people talking about this. This is a miniatures game that Rackham released in 2000 
Now there's a new edition from a French company, uh, Edition Sans Detour, which has around $700,000 in support. And the, the base level to get in is around $350. That's wow. That's it. You can pledge for a dollar just to get updates, or you can do three fifty, and that's when the early bird goes. It's around four hundred to get the project, which is one hundred and seventy-eight unique miniatures. Wow! And then whatever stretch goals you get with it, and you get things like that, and yeah, that's that's you're committing a lot of money, and you're done. Otherwise, probably, maybe, I don't know. It, it's it's kind of amazing to see that come about. Well, it definitely seems like it's having an effect on the smaller independent publishers that put out a couple games a quarter um, that don't kickstart. Right? They don't they don't have that built in fan base to automatically prepay for the game. They're just putting the games in stores. So I think I don't know. I hope it's not a trend that uh, it's going to hurt those publishers. But we've definitely seen some and experience some of those games getting getting passed over for for these huge games absolutely there's there's questions whether that model's even going to sustain uh you mentioned uh the new uh zombicide that's not as high as the previous kickstarter so far what did that one what did the previous right, the, even even though it's over two million their previous kickstarter was over five million yeah i mean that's crazy hmm so now it's a disappointment well, it's not over yet, but... Yeah. Right, it still has a long way to go. We're just Speculating. noticing that it wasn't as crazy high as the other Zombicides. I don't know. It's, it's hard, to, hard to imagine. It, what's funny is, are, is this all just one market on there? And, of course, I think we pay a lot more closer attention to Kickstarter than a lot of other people. I don't know. If you go talk in Europe, I don't know what it's like with European... That's true, but it's just odd to see so many games actually struggling to make it. Um, I mean, there always is games struggling to make it. That's not, that, it's unrealistic to say that. But the reality is, is there's subjects that actually have somewhat of a profile that are just chugging over the finish line, right? And that's a difficult thing because we've had this conversation, I think, last week where people were talking about they wouldn't, if it didn't, f wasn't funded already, they weren't going to back it. And I'm like, but that's counterintuitive. If you want it to succeed, you should back it. And, yeah, um, you know, they expect it within a day. <laughs> Yeah, that's like the tragedy of the commons, right? Like everybody expects it, someone else to back it so they can buy it or get it. But then eventually nobody backs it so it doesn't get created. Yeah, that's, it's terrible. Hopefully some of these publishers um, will just go ahead and do them. Uh, particular, like, it, it, for example, was the Barkside. It was odd that they were making it a Kickstarter-only deal, but obviously it's career board games, so maybe they, maybe they have distribution issues, you know, as far as getting it uh, into stores easily. And I know that that's probably an issue too, just getting shelf space. Or maybe the Kickstarter just serves as marketing and then they actually don't end up paying anything in the end. Uh, French company putting out Imperial 8. It, the game was advertised as Kickstarter exclusive. Project was canceled within a few days or within a week at most. And now they've said it's still coming out in French. So the, the production is starting or moving along and who knows if it'll come out in other languages, but it will still exist. We had Monumental that we dis discussed before actually cancel the campaign, and it was a Kickstarter exclusive as well. And it was quite expensive to just get into it, like nearly $100 for the base game or something like that. Or maybe over, it might have been 120 I did not know that was canceled. Huh. Oh, uh, that's a bummer. I did not hear that those were canceled, man. That was, those were super exciting for from the news out of Cannes. Well, it, I, I'm sure Monumental's going to relaunch. They just needed to, I think their campaign needed a little bit more you know, finesse because it's actually looks really, really great. The, the weird thing with Monumental getting canceled is there's still plenty of other projects out there. Those miniature games that are getting the support. There's a new Hellboy project from Mantic games that I believe is around 150,000 almost immediately after launching. There's court of the dead from project Ray gun, which is a division of USAopoly. That's I think one and a quarter, uh, 125,000 uh, within a day or two of launching. So it's these mo these miniature based games coming out. So Monumental got canceled, um, not hitting those targets that those other games have already achieved. So I don't know if it's just a plethora of games that are crowding everything out. 
And there's plenty of other more standard games that are that are coming out as well. Queen Games has a new version of Alhambra. Not a big box, but a mega box. That's right, the mega box with tiles that are not four and a half centimeters wide, but five centimeters wide. I, I'm not sure why the, the extra half centimeter <laughs> matters, but you know, with, with an interesting hook for marketing this where it has expansions from, it has nine expansions from different designers. So there's a Steffen Feld mini expansion that you can add to Alhambra or a Michael Schacht one or a Michael Renick one and Klaus Jürgen Vreda. You, you can have all these little things. I mean, Alhambra already has that with six different expansions with 24 modules total. You just Queen wins the mega box. You know. Queen wins the mega box. <laughs> Except for the ultra box. Oh, uh, okay. That they'll be coming the in The ultra mega mega box. Yeah. <laughs> you guys uh, forgot about the Uba Uba box. Uba box. Yes. We could do that. Anything else? Yes. In the everything old is new again department, we have Tasty Mintral Games just launched a Kickstarter for one of their first games they ever published, Homesteaders, 10th anniversary. Uh, with an expansion. So if you missed out on the game, and probably most of you did, because I think they had a very small print run, and this was a long time ago. Ten years ago is like ancient history in the board game world. It is back again for you to buy, and it was a pretty solid game, as I recall. So check that out on Kickstarter. Was that one of the... Was Terra Prime the other one that came out, like one of the first ones? Yeah, Terra Prime and yes. Homesteaders were their first two published games, I believe. Although they may have some, maybe their jab was in there too. But they had some production issues on those first few games, just like paint not being dry and stuff like that. Right, I think the story was they were left on the docks to dry and it was cold and it got moldy and wet and something happened. That's gross. Yeah, that sucks because that almost killed them right off the bat. So they were lucky to survive that uh, problem with the production. Hopefully everything will be good now. And might, I'm pretty sure it will be because most of their games, all their games that have come out since then have been great. So check that out from Tasty Mintral Games. Um, and it was just one of those classics that kind of gotten passed over over the years. And, you know, because it wasn't in print, but now it is. So check it out. That's cool because I'm actually excited to try that game out. I never did play it. The copies that we had access to were damaged. I think they were part of that damaged shipment. And so I never actually got to play that game. So that wraps up another week of the Board Game Geek Show. Thank you, everybody, for watching, subscribing, thumbs, and everything on YouTube and Twitter. We really appreciate the feedback. Also, I'd like to ask you to send us your questions. We're going to start a new segment called the Q&A. So if you have a question for me, Lincoln, Eric, or Rodney, you'll be on the show in the future, uh, send them to contact at boardgamegeek.com. And thank you, Lincoln. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Scott. We'll see you when we're totally jet lagged for the next show. <laughs> Good luck in Japan. I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys film there. And I will see you out both at BG Spring. Bye. <laughs>